uh, this afternoon, uh, or we're thrilled that you have joined us now. My name is Nicole Golden. I'm a senior associate here with the Project on Prosperity and Development, and I'm really thrilled to be here um, to, uh, to lead our afternoon discussion with three very esteemed colleagues that I will introduce uh, briefly in a moment. Um, the persistence of food security, rural poverty, as well as a sense of urgency that's developing around demographics and the global youth unemployment crisis, I think is elevating the conversation around youth employment, youth workforce, and in particular around agriculture to new levels. Roughly half the world's population, as many of you may know, um, is under the age of 25. Roughly 85% of those young people live in the developing world where agriculture is still a large share um, of GDP and of employment, as much as 70% you know, um, in many places. Um, at the same time around the world, young people are three or four times more likely to be unemployed than the general population, and undermining economic growth, destabilizing families and communities, um, and really dampening future prospects, not only of young people, but their countries um, and really the world at large. The IFC, the International Finance Corporation, has estimated that in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, a million jobs a month, a million a month are required to be created, new jobs created just to keep up with population and new entrants into the labor force. So really, again, we're seeing a huge um, need um, to engage young people and to get them into the workforce in a sustainable and productive way. And while we know that there are many kind of shared constraints and challenges um, to that, to engaging young people in the workforce, which we're going to talk about, um, there are some distinct factors associated with, uh, with agriculture, a sort of unique set of challenges that we will hopefully explore and unpack a little more today. And we're really still, I think, learning about those dynamics uh, and searching for what works. Um, but we know that the jobs and uh, sort of labor market crisis has no single cause, uh, no single solution. It's uh, whether it's the shortage or the mismatch of skills um, or entrepreneurialism um, or other constraints, uh, such as in particular to agriculture, such as stigma, uh, low productivity, um, lack of access to land and or value chains. Um, all these things are limiting youth opportunity um, and, and rural populations opportunities. Uh, one thing um, that experience and emerging evidence does make abundantly clear is that collaboration is required. Uh, that it's an all hands on deck approach. Uh, public and private sectors may have differing bottom lines, but both have much to gain or lose uh, when it comes to harnessing youth's potential. So there's lots of space for innovation to create shared value um, and to find ways that serve both the interests of rural youth as well as the interests of business. Um, so with that, I am very pleased to, uh, to introduce our very esteemed panel to help us explore these issues and these dynamics a little bit further. We have Bill Guyton from the World Cocoa Foundation. Um, you have their bios. He's really been sort of leading and, and not only developing the World Cocoa Foundation, but for many years looking at sustainable agriculture and how to um, bridge industry um, and government and, and bring those together. Uh, my friend and colleague, Bill Reese, president and CEO of the International Youth Foundation, um, who to many in the room needs no introduction, um, but has been, as my friend and colleague Dan Rundy says, doing public-private partnerships before they were cool. Um, and of course, we have uh, thrilled to have Sherry Youssef, um, uh, a youth and youth development uh, workforce specialist with uh, DAI, among a number of other hats um, that we'll hear, a tech, we'll hear about a technologist as well. So with that, we're going to um, have them all just share a few words of their own perspectives, and we'll go uh, from there into some questions. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Great, Nicole, and, and thank you for the introduction. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here on the panel with Bill and, and with Sherry as well. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm with the World Cocoa Foundation. We're an organization that was formed back in 2000 by a handful of chocolate companies at the time 
Today we are about 110 companies that represent both large, large branded companies, processors, traders from different geographies, uh, including North America and Europe primarily, but also increasingly a lot of companies from uh, cocoa producing uh, uh, regions of the world, such as West Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. Um, our model of, of, of programs or implementation on the ground has been through partnerships, and over the years we've developed strong partnerships with USAID, with U.S. Department of Agriculture here in the United States, as well as with the Gates Foundation and others. Um, a lot of our focus has been on in the past has been on, on looking at some of the, the outreach programs that we can do at the farm level through, through farmer field schools. Um, and in particular, uh, one of our first programs with the, was the Sustainable Tree Crops program with USAID, which reached uh, many farmers in West Africa. Um, we used the farmer field school methodology during that training, and it was interesting for me to go and visit some of the, the farmers at that time, because uh, looking at the average age, most of them were probably in their 40s or 50s. It was rare to get younger people involved in those programs. So we realized that we needed to do a better job of reaching out to the next generation of cocoa farmers. So just to give a little bit of context about cocoa, about 2 million cocoa farmers in West Africa, 70% uh, of the supply. Um, Government-controlled boards uh, in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, so you can't ignore the, the public sector when you're looking at outreach to cocoa farmers. Uh, family, family farms, usually of high, five hectares or less, so very small family farms scattered around uh, rural areas. A lot of the farmers are tenant farmers. Uh, lack of access to schools, particularly in Cote d'Ivoire, that's a problem where in the cocoa sector there's estimated uh, 3,000 schools that are, are needed in order to reach the, the growing number of young people. Um, and, in, and at the same time, there's, there's some severe problems with the cocoa itself. Um, about a third of the crop is lost to diseases and pests each year. So with given that context and all of the problems th that are out there, we realized that within the cocoa industry that we needed to step up and do more. So in 2012-2013, in we made a, a fairly radical change in the cocoa sector within, within uh, the World Cocoa Foundation. We, uh, reformulated our board at, to, to include uh, CEO or vice presidents of the major companies as well as some of the smaller company representatives. We formed a technical working committee under the board that would really look deeper into how we better implement programs on the ground and better reach uh, different ages of cocoa farmers. Um, and that was the birth of, of Coco Action, which is, is our platform that we, we call it today, which includes 11 of the largest chocolate and cocoa companies in the world. Um, these 11 companies signed a letter of intent or a statement of intent with our, our organization to reach over 300,000 farmers in West Africa, in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, with the intent of, of really taking a step change in improving the productivity and the, and the livelihoods. They agreed to a combined package of productivity, such as um, uh, in, improved access to fertilizer and planting material uh, and farmer training, as well as community development, such as um, improved access to education, uh, gender, as well as child labor prevention. So if we're looking at the youth, youth inclusion uh, and, and young farmers, it really fits into that both pillars of, of what we're looking at in Cocoa Action. There's a productivity side to it, and there's also uh, within the community development pillar under the education a way that we need to more effectively reach these young farmers. So um, in May of last year, we signed an MOU with the governments of, of both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire with the heads, heads of states of those countries. We, we brought our board out to West Africa where they visited each other's cocoa farm or cocoa programs and got a, a much better idea of what, what their competitors were doing on the ground and how we could better capitalize on, on what everyone was doing on the ground to really make a, a, a much bigger uh, impact on the ground. So um, the other interesting thing about Cocoa Action is that we agreed on a, a common results framework on how we measure progress or success, and that has never been done in the past. There's, individual companies have had their own ways of measuring progress or implementing programs. We want to allow that creativity to continue forward in the, and, and to, to foster innovation, but also to look at how we better measure progress across different companies and, and programs. 
So we're excited about this, and, and it's going to be an interesting journey over the, the next few years to see how it evolves. And we also want to see how we can better reach out to the next generation of cocoa farmers, realizing that there are so many young people out there um, that, are, uh, that possibly can, can move into the cocoa sector, whether that be into farming or, or other services in the supply chain. So, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. I definitely have a, a couple of follow-up questions, but for now I want to keep opening up the conversation and unpacking some of the, the issues to address. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill um, to speak from kind of IYF experience in, in workforce across many sectors. Thanks, Nicole, and thank you to CSIS and our MC and host today, Dan. Uh, Rundy, we're happy at IYF to have created a partnership with CSIS to make youth not a special little interest group that people talk about and research over here on the side, but see that it cuts across the whole notion of peace, prosperity, security issues that a think tank like this would be dealing with. Workforce development, and I'm, gonna th I'm, I'm glad to follow Bill, who has the real rural agriculture experience, because most of our work is in urban areas. But workforce development, and the, really the billion new jobs that need to be created over the next 10 years to absorb this youth cohort, in, well absorb it into the 21st century economy, is both urban and rural. And we can talk about men and women being from Mars and Venus, but rural and urban aren't on different planets. And they, they, have, they, they do interact in good ways and bad ways as people move from one to the other. And unfortunately, they're really only moving from one to the other and not back and forth. But we need success for young people, economic growth and inclusion in both sectors, rural and, and urban. Uh, and it's not just to keep people back on the farm, so to speak, or out of the cities. Uh, urbanization really is a trend that will not go away. Uh, but both cultures or environments, if you will, of urban and rural, uh, they mo both must prosper. And what we've heard this morning is a real focus on the rural areas and how do you bring that young population, or that's the way we would look at it here in this panel, how do you bring them in so that they, they, they see the potential that our speakers earlier have been saying, well, there's great potential out there in these smallholder farm and value chains and all that. Well, try telling that to an 18 or 22 year old who only sees an opportunity maybe in a capital city. So that youth bulge is huge. It's been talked about now for five or 10 years. It will go away over the next 40 or 50 or 60 years, uh, but that's, that's a long time. And, and it will be a factor particularly in uh, South, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, North Africa. Frankly, it's the youth bulge is, or, or youth employability is a, a, a challenge in every country in the world. And we published a couple of years ago a, a white paper called Opportunity for Action, Preparing Youth for 21st Century Livelihoods, and it covers rich and poor countries. Italy, with a shrinking population, still doesn't have all its young people well employed. So we, this is a global phenomenon that we all can get our hands around. And the return on investment, when we do it right, and, it, and there's no way that we, societies, can do it right without all the sectors working together. The return on investment out of a good youth program, you get a healthy, civically engaged, and employed adult. That's the outcome we're looking for. And the return on investment for that is 50 years. That 20-year-old will live at least another 50 years, hopefully working, most of those 50 years and being a taxpayer. And without becoming a taxpayer, the societies that she and he are living in won't be sustainable. Nicole Golden helped us, Hilton Worldwide, IYF, and CSIS create a global youth well-being index. Uh, and we published it a year ago. And it really is an analytical tool and an investor's guide that you all could use. It's not, not proprietary. It talks about six domains of well-being, education, healthiness, civic engagement, a sense of hope and security, the psychological piece, what does a young person see in his or her future and, 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 and in their life in, in a given country, their IT connectivity, uh, and their employability. And I like to say that if we get them through all those domains in a nice progression, because some people say youth development is only really a transition from childhood to adulthood, when we get them through to become an 18, 20, 22 year old and they can't find a job, I think we've failed. We've all failed. Society's failed. Uh, so shared value is, is, in, is not really just a new name for, uh, on, on your old wine bottle. Uh, although 
corporate partnerships and public-private partnerships and things like that have gone on for years and years, but particularly at, 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 at USAID with the Global Development Alliance, when they decided to try to mainstream that, and then you start seeing it playing across other development agencies and private foundations, uh, it, that too has helped, I think, the corporate world, and the corporate world has helped the public and, 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 non and philanthropic sectors really understand what shared value can mean and what we, our experiences at IYF with Caterpillar, Cummins, Hilton Worldwide, McDonald's, Walmart, and I will say two companies too. We did $70 million of CSR investment with Nokia and Lucent. Guess how much they're giving today? Zero. A company cannot have a shared value or a philanthropic or CSR program if it's not making money. So just remember that. Uh, employability to us is really job readiness. Some people talk about the technical skills that the market needs, the skills mismatch. A lot of, more people today are talking about the life skills, the employability skills. Others will say companies hire for the technical skills they think they need and then fire for the lack of life skills or problem solving or employability skills that that young person doesn't bring to the job. There's an awful lot of talk about entrepreneurship and there should be, but I maintain that we want all young people to be entrepreneurs or be entrepreneurial in a mindset because frankly, if you're not entrepreneurial, you probably won't find a, be able to go out and even market yourself to get a good job even though you're working for someone else. Not everyone who takes a $100 loan from microcredit in my book is, a, is an entrepreneur. That's survival economics. But don't we want all young people to be entrepreneurial? But entrepreneurship, too, as a piece of the economic pie, is terribly important because there won't be enough jobs, particularly in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa. So to, to, to put in our mind that the goal is to get a job in the formal economy that pays taxes, that receives social benefits, has a social safety net, great, but there won't be enough jobs. So how do we get young people in a mindset to create their own livelihood, maybe an informal self-employment that could maybe someday lead to a, a bigger, bigger piece of work? We've worked over the last few years in Antioquia, for example, in Colombia, where 12 years ago, the fellow who led the program down there from the private sector was the mayor. Well, now he's the governor uh, of Antioquia. And he, with Colombian and the types of international companies that we've been talking about today, uh, and with their Ministry of Labor, not the Ministry of Education, uh, have been doing an all, all sorts of things with us, the Inter-American Development Bank, USAID, so you've got public, private, multilateral, and, and, and global, and local companies. And I just want to come back to Deidre White's point earlier. The local private sector is as important or maybe more important to get involved in these public-private partnerships and not just the big name global companies because, frankly, there's more money at that local level than there'll ever be from the, the big global companies. And you get then the national buy-in. If we talk about country ownership today and the, and the local national businesses don't own any of their country's future, uh, we're, we're not doing real well. We've done similar things in Egypt with USAID and MasterCard uh, and working with different ministries too. Uh, not just the education ministry. If you're talking about hospitality, you wanna be working with the tourism ministry because they have a vested interest. So when we talk about public-private partnerships, we need to look at the whole of government in that, in that use of the word. I'll just close with one initiative that we and others have created in the last few years, or last few months really, with the World Bank, Accenture, RAND, the ILO, uh, foreign aid agencies such as Norway, Germany, and the UK foundations such as Rockefeller and uh, MasterCard and multinationals such as Walmart, Hilton, Caterpillar, Microsoft and all and others and it's called Solutions for Youth Employment. And the idea is to create a grand public-private partnership, if you will, around learning, leveraging and linking of a proven practice, scalable experiences to bring solutions to youth employment. And I say solutions because there is no vaccine. There's no one single, single technological whiz-bang innovation that's gonna solve youth employment uh, in the United States or in the poorest countries in the world. It's gonna take a long-term shared value partnership between public, private, nonprofit, for-profit, philanthropic to make it work in any society. Great, thank you so much, Bill. Sherry, some thoughts. 
Thanks, Nicole. And thank you all for being here, and thank you, CSIS. So um, I was asked to talk briefly about two things, about technology and about skills development, and what are kind of the core skills to focus on. And I thought the best way to do it would be really to give some just innovative case studies. So I'm going to talk about a couple examples that I think really illustrate how technology can be more deeply embedded in the sector. But I'll start just by saying that developing nations typically um, settle for technologies that have been developed somewhere else for other purposes. And I think that there's a, glowing, a growing recognition that that's not sustainable, that developing countries, local communities really need to develop their own technologies with their own solutions. And there's some very innovative work going on in that space. Um, MIT has a learning independence network project where they are developing these networks. They're piloting it in Costa Rica and India right now where it's local universities, local private sector, local foundations that are really trying to leverage local solutions and local technology <clears throat> development. And I think that that's really the best way to bring kind of the digital revolution into these developing communities. Um, I heard the other day at a CSIS uh, round table that the average age globally, I think, of a farmer was 55 years old. So if we really want to introduce technology into the ag sector, it's going to be by youth and really engaging youth, meeting where, youth where they are, finding entry points that are appealing to youth. Um, they are digital natives, they are early adopters, and they will be the platform by which we're going to get technology deeply embedded into the sector. Um, to date, technology has really focused on mobile apps and text messaging really to help farmers, you know, link to suppliers, understand weather forecasting, et cetera. But I think that we need to move beyond that now. Um, I think that there's a lot of room for more innovative technology. Um, one example um, that I have been working on and that I'm seeing kind of expanding is leveraging serious gaming and social media for youth engagement. Um, so that would be game-based learning, um, digital games right now is an industry that's bigger than the music industry, that's bigger than the film industry. It's what youth are doing. They are gaming all day, so why not put that gaming to a more effective use? Um, the beauty of well-designed games are that the player assumes different roles. They can fail in a safe environment. They can understand kind of uh, career progression, what skills requirements are involved. Um, it really designs and allows for a very deep interaction and, and safe environment for youth to really explore things they might not do. Um, and it's game-based learning is just-in-time knowledge. It's not just-in-case knowledge. So you're really doing it hands-on in a safe environment so that when you need it in the real world, it's actually something you've done before. Um, one example that's being worked on is something called Farmville. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar, but Facebook games are extremely popular. Um, millions of people are playing them, so it's trying to look at gaming where you can use those games to change behavior virtually, so it would be exposing the user to what various activities can or cannot be done on a farm, what's the opportunities for engagement on a farm, both kind of on-farm and off-farming activities. Um, but there's taking that gaming to a new level now and trying to engage that user in the real world as well. So it's promoting a theory of change virtually as well as in the real world where you would be prompted at some point during the game to get offline, go do something in the real world, take a training course, engage with an agriculture NGO, you would get points and then come back in the game and progress more quickly. So you're stimulating this virtual behavior change not just in the virtual world but in the real world as well. Um, there's another very interesting um, activity that's starting also through MIT. They're called Fab Labs. They're fabrication labs. They're becoming extremely popular and highly effective, again, in developing local solutions to local problems. They've done a great activity in India with milk contamination. Um, they were importing all kinds of equipment to deal with it. It was unsustainable. They couldn't maintain the equipment, so they've developed some local solutions that have really kind of mitigated the problem at the local level. They can fix the equipment, they can modify the equipment on a local need basis. So I really think that the top-down approach in technology just doesn't work anymore. And um, it's nice to see that there's a realization of this and a lot of effort being made to do that from the bottom up and really look at technology in, in a more innovative way. Um, there's another very interesting app called the Lunda Light Poultry app. It was developed by some um, poultry farmers in Uganda. Um, it, I'm sure some people in the room are familiar with it, but for those that aren't, it kind of takes that mobile app to a new level. It's got a diagnosis function where you can visually diagnose what the problem may be with the poultry. It's got a record keeping function where it helps you with your book keeping, reminds you of vaccination, vaccination and feeding times. 
It's got a store function where it can market, you know, through Google Maps, it can show you where drug stores are, show you where, you know, sales points are. So that's really hopefully where technology can, can really take education and training to a new level. I mean, youth can be engaged as extension officers, take these smartphones to the farm and really educate and train people on, on site. Um, so I guess my conclusion in terms of technology is that there's a lot of innovation taking place and hopefully that will continue and that youth will definitely be the means by which we kind of get um, more technology in the sector. In terms of skills, what are the kind of skills that are, are in demand? I spent the last year going from Egypt to Jordan to Pakistan, Indonesia, interviewing private sector employers, kind of what are, in the terms of vocational and, and technical occupations, what are your needs? And I think almost across the board, every employer said it is soft skills, as Bill is just saying. It is no longer technical skills. It's attitude. It's, you know, really just a focus on work ethic. Um, another big kind of consensus across the board was English. The ability to read technical uh, manuals is a huge obstacle. I think English is the new operating system, for lack of a better word, in terms of global communication and, and, and training. So I wish I could say there were kind of sector-specific ones, but I think across the board, it's really attitude in English that came across as the big one. Great. Thank you all. Sherry, I'm going to stick with you for a minute. Um, I was fascinated to hear about the gaming and the, really the application of technology. And one of the issues I mentioned in the opening we see with youth and, and agriculture in particular um, is this issue of stigma, if you will, um, that despite the vast opportunities for young people in agriculture and often the need that in many places young people simply aren't attracted to the sector, um, aren't willing to really sort of make the investment for a long-term, um, you know, increasingly value-added career in the sector. Do you think that sort of technology can help alleviate that? I mean, do you see the gaming and all these opportunities sort of making the industry, you know, sexier, if you will? Um, I think it's, it's just making its way into the ag sector. The hospitality sector is one that has used game and gaming very successfully to overcome those um, kind of mindset changes and perception shifts. So there are games, I think it's the Hilton Corporation, um, but one of the larger kind of hotel corporations has used gaming where you build games and the player goes in as you know, the bed maker and progresses along in the hotel to become an F&B manager and really see their career progress. It kind of gives you your salary qualifications. You really can role play and understand that there is potential in this career in a way that is almost impossible offline, for lack of a better word. So I definitely think, and that's kind of the goal with these um, kind of farming and ag, ag games is to really simulate the potential in the sector. Um, both on and off the farm. Um, I think DuPont and John Deere also have invested huge amounts of money into this gaming space in public schools at the lower level. Uh, they call it the farm to fork games where little kids are learning where their dinner came from and getting excited about what it would mean to be able to make, you know, grow dinner. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's just moving into the ag sector, but it's made huge progress in other areas where there's kind of taboos and culture of shames and, and kind of stigmas associated with the professions or careers. Yeah, so interesting. Um, both, you know, Sherry, you and Bill talked about um, the, the commonality that you're hearing from employers um, about soft skills, life skills, employability. And I'm curious, um, Bill Guyton, um, you know, you talked about sort of from a very industry perspective and your experience on farmer field schooling. Is that what you're hearing from, you know, within, you know, the ag industry and or are there more kind of technical skills and are you seeing an evolving of the kind of curricula for agricultural ed education and training? Yeah, that's a great question, Nicole. And, and we're actually working on a program now with USAID. It's a public-private partnership called the African Cocoa Initiative and it covers four West African countries. And the program is interesting because it's all about institutional capacity building in those countries. And we're looking at different levels. Um, there's one component that's looking at research. It's looking at how to build the skills within the research institutes in Africa uh, so that uh, researchers, young researchers, have the ability to fingerprint cocoa to know exactly what they've got in those research facilities and how to multiply. Uh, through that. Through that component, we've actually able, been able to uh, tie it in with USDA Borlaug program. So we're bringing 
not only having those, those researchers build capacity in country, but bringing them over here to work with researchers in the United States at USDA and, and with land grant universities. Uh, another component is really interesting too, it's on uh, what we're doing with crop life within that program to look at spray service providers. And for that, uh, traditionally a lot of farmers have used, uh, uh, sprayed their own farms, uh, a lot of times without pr protective gear and sometimes where their children are in the fields. So with this program or this component of, of, of the program of uh, the African Cocoa Initiative, we're actually professionalizing uh, young people to be spray service providers, to give them training on the proper uh, clothing to wear and the proper application. So we're actually taking the sprays away from farmers and putting it, giving it to professionals, thus creating jobs in the rural sector. So that we're employing people through crop life uh, in the rural sectors of Africa to do that. So that's a, that's an inco or that's a uh, job creation opportunity. And then the other one that's really interesting too is on the, on the extension side. We're working to help build the capacity of, of local extension services in those countries uh, by providing grants to local institutions on how to do that. And part of it uh, gets back to, Sherry, on what you were saying about looking at new technologies. And we have, a, for example, a mobile phone technology project that we're working on through that uh, with, with uh, our company members called CocoLink, which is providing uh, 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 SMS messaging between farmers, among farmers and, and with the uh, extension service in Ghana. And we're hoping to roll that out into other countries as well. So, it's a little bit rudimentary compared with, with your example, Sherry, but we're hoping someday that it will become more sophisticated and we'll get into mobile money and, and other applications, which I think will be a magnet to young people. So Bill, taking some of those, Bill Rees, taking some of those um, thoughts forward, you talked about entrepreneurialism. Um, in the work that you've been doing with, with young entrepreneurs, how important has the idea of sort of supply chains and value chains, and if you're thinking about sort of agricultural entrepreneurialism, um, how important do you think that those opportunities are for kind of you know young people, whether you know rural, urban? Um... Good. I mean, we've heard a lot today, and a lot has been written and talked about over the last couple of years about the agricultural value chains, but there's a value chain in hospitality. Think how much is farmed out from a hotel to a laundry, to a pastry maker, to a, you know, the touristy arts and crafts that you would buy and they sell in the hotel. These things aren't made by the hotel, but they're a supply to the guy who grows tomatoes three miles away and, and brings them into the, to the kitchen there. A huge supply chain of an industry that employs 10% of the world's population travel, tourism, and resorts. And that's not rich Europeans and Americans. People think, oh, that must be ecotourism that's created all this stuff. No, it's a billion people today that are in the middle class of the world that weren't there 30 and 40 years ago, and they're Chinese and Indian and Brazilians and, and so forth. And they're traveling in their countries, in their regions, and around the world. And that industry is huge. So there is a supply chain or a value chain within hospitality. There would be one within retail. Where does Walmart buy all its stuff? Walmart may be the largest employer in Mexico and we're training a lot of their entry level people in Chile, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa. But think of their supply chain of people who sell their stuff to be sold on, uh, on their floors. Those are tremendous opportunities in growth markets because retail, hospitality, service industries are not going to go away. Old-fashioned manufacturing industries, frankly, are not where the jobs are today, and there will be fewer of them tomorrow. But the, 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 and then if you're talking about entry level, so your, your, your gaming of the hotel is absolutely right. You could come in making beds as an entry level you don't even probably need a full high school degree to start off or, or bussing tables in a hotel. But if you do it well, three years later, you're head of hospitality for rooms, you know, floors five through 10 in a big hotel. It's an upwardly mobile if people see it as a career and not just a lousy first job. But most of us in America think of a first job is, you know, bussing tables too when you get out of your liberal arts college and, and haven't yet found your first job. But in much of the world, that isn't what you do. And the culture of shame 
whatever and however shame would be interpreted. And sometimes it's a gender thing. Would I want my daughter working in a hotel? Isn't hotels where nasty things happen like sex and booze and dancing and all that? So no, I'm not going to let my daughter go work in that environment. That may not be the case in Latin America, but it would be the case in much of the Middle East. Now, how do you get around that? But how do you get a hotel too to make that young woman and, not, and, and her parents feel that this is a good place for my daughter to be because it will treat her well and she'll have some upward mobility. So there's a lot of work to be done here. You were a great segue, as always, Bill, thinking ahead of me, um, into a question, Sherry, I wanted to pose to you about young women in particular, um, whether it's in you know, engaging young women in the science and technology aspects of gaming and technology, and also just in the kind of skills and workforce um, work that you've been doing, what have been some of the particular challenges that you've seen um, for young women and how, you know, are there any really good examples of, that you've seen in terms of overcoming in terms of best practice? Sure. Um, so, good question. <laughs> um, I, I was recently in Egypt and there was a, there's an organization, a foundation there called the Shura Foundation, which is as Bill was saying, kind of local CSR. It's all local private sector companies that have invested in kind of um, Egypt's future farming farmers and really developing competitive crops. So they focused on wheat as their competitive crop. And um, all technical schools in Egypt, technical vocational schools in the ag sector have a plot of land associated with them which are highly underutilized. So they've partnered with um, the Ministry of Education to use those plots and they do these regular competitions where um, each person gets a certain piece of land and over a certain period of time, he who has the most productive growth gets a 10,000 pound reward and then they go to the regional competition, et cetera. Um, women had challenges kind of working on the farm per se, so they designed a program that was specifically catered to where women could be kind of monitoring and do the data analysis for them and doing all the other parts of the non kind of working farm components of the competition. Um, so I thought that was a successful model. They also do, they have a kind of one month internship program where they've worked with the Ministry of Education in the private sector where students in their third year go for one year for this kind of on-farm internship program. Again, the women were, could not be sent for a month away, so they designed it with a handful of private sector companies in local areas where they could go into kind of the, the office and do kind of non-on-farming activities. So I think it's really being able to accommodate in a geography, geography, on a geography by geography basis, what are the cultural, social constraints and working around them? Because I don't think it's a resistance of women to get into the workforce, it's just being able to find something that is culturally and socially appropriate. appropriate. It was interesting in Jordan as well in terms of gaming. They have a gaming lab there that they're trying to develop. Um, again, they're trying to get women from the rural areas to come in. It was a huge challenge, so then they went out into the rural areas and they do these gaming kind of boot camps and um, they do women only ones, but one of the heads of the gaming lab was telling me women have a very particular skill set because right now in terms of the competitiveness of apps on phones has become so severe that the, um, the graphics design is really the distinguishing element now. And women have a particular ability to see <laughs> the different colors in a, in a different way than, the ma than males do. When you ask a woman what color is your sweater, it's pale green, mint green, it's for a male, it's green. So these women have this competitive edge now in terms of being in graphics design and really making these apps far more competitive. A lot of international companies are now outsourcing to these women. So I think it's really just understanding when and how and where they fit and designing kind of your intervention around that. Kind of young women in particular. Thank you, Nicole. Well, we have been engaged on a, a project in the past um, th with our company members and, and with USAID called Echoes. And I see Vicki Walker from Winrock International here, and, and also I know World Ed was, was involved in that project. It was a great program 
uh, looking at both strengthening uh, basic education as well as vocational and, and outreach to women through family scholarships. And it's, it's such a great program because it's low cost. It's a way to, to, to work directly with women on helping them to start up new businesses. And through that, through that scholarship, family scholarship, uh, the, the conditions were that the, the uh, I think it was, if, if I remember right, Vicki, you can correct me, a, a, third of the, a third of the money went to keep their children in school and then the other two thirds to invest in their business over the next two year period. And then there was a, a kind of a peer pressure within the community to follow up afterwards to make sure that these women had invested in, in what they had said they would and to make sure that the children were still in school. So it, it was a really, it's a really good project that, that was started and it's actually still ongoing. I think there's a lot of companies that saw that that's a, it's an easy way to invest in a community and to really see some significant changes. I want to pick up on something, um, Bill Reese, that you said about, thanks for giving a plug to our uh, Global Youth Wellbeing Index. Um, but one of the things, again, that we found is that the enabling environment and the conditions um, often matter in both sort of generating the supply side, the workforce development, as well as the, the demand side. Um, so, so, Bill Guyton, just coming back to you, as far as you know, the sort of enabling conditions that you see, you know, being particularly important for the, for getting into the industry, for getting into agriculture and, and being successful. Um, where have you seen, um, you know, gaps um, from a kind of institutional or, you know, land rights or other kind of areas um, that may be affecting young people um, less explicitly than, you know, a skills piece? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so Bill, Bill Guyton and then we'll come back. I, I think, Nicole, you, you, you mentioned a, a word that, that sticks out in my mind a lot, and that's land tenure. And it's a huge problem in, in West Africa as well as other areas where, where cocoa is grown. And, um, you know, I, w I remember um, just a few weeks ago I was meeting with the head of the cocoa marketing board in Ghana, and they're looking at ways that they can provide land to young farmers. Um, and to, to give them the, the right skill sets so that they can actually succeed. But um, it, it's a slow go because land availability, as we all know, is a, is a, is a main constraint. And in, in particular, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, you have a lot of migrant or tenant farmers. And, and if, if farmers don't have, that are, that are farming the land, don't have control over the assets there, it's really difficult to, to move forward. So I think that's a critical factor. It's definitely something um, that, you know, we hear from young people as, you know, even beyond the stigma piece as a constraint. You know, why should I, you know, think about going into this industry when I don't have access to land um, and I won't have, you know, full ownership? So um, it's, it's something that's really interesting. I've, I've heard it um, come up and continue to come up in conversations around the post-2015 and the sustainable development goal objectives. And as people talk about sort of land tenure and land rights in that context, kind of Let's also think about sort of young people as well as as well as women. Um, Bill, I want to come back to you, um, Bill Reese, um, and all of the you know the the long the many partnerships that you've had with private sector with with companies um, and advising them on how to best sort of engage with youth. And sort of one question I have is: Is there um, a, any kind of single more common? Um, almost, you know, misconception about young people um, for companies or um, shared, you know, shared understanding of why it's so important to get this right um, when it comes to kind of young people and workforce development? Well, at least to be a little provocative, I'd say that global business gets youth development better than our foreign aid agencies do. There's a lot of talk about getting young people employed so they don't become terrorists or, or whatever else. Uh, global businesses though today are really run, even if they're, on, let's say an American company, but their executives are Brazilian and Egyptian and Thai and Korean and whatever, and they rotate around the world. And then their local staff uh, or their dealers or their owners or their supply chains are substantial business people in their own communities, they get it. For particularly, I think, in the emerging market countries and those that have some semblance or, or more than even a semblance of rule of law and, and, and some sort of democratic rule. 
uh, failed states, that's a whole other equation. But businesses get it because they know that their future consumers are these young people. They know that their future employees are these young people. And if they're sourcing, selling, manufacturing, or whatever they're doing in whatever country they're in, the stability of that country and those communities that they're working in make a huge difference in terms of their, their long-term sustainability as an organization. If they're trying legitimately to do some triple bottom line in the community, but the community is in chaos, you don't have a lot of chance to do that. So I think, frankly, global businesses get the youth issue. The question is, what do you, what do, you do about it? Because I think it's more complicated. This is one of the more complicated issues, I think, of getting teenagers and young adults ready for jobs that don't actually exist, or don't, enough jobs don't exist in, in economies. So what do you do about it? Quite frankly, it's easier to get mother-to-child transmission of HIV cured, it's easier to get every little girl into elementary school than it is to get 15 and 20 year olds who have dropped out of school ready for a job and a decent job in a global economy. These are, these are difficult issues. And I think, frankly, some of our foundations, without mentioning any names, uh, have shied away from this because they don't see the quick win or the technological or the accountable measurable thing that you can see in three and six and 12 months that you've really made progress. Youth employability and the growth of our, well, let me just put it this way. Youth employability will not be solved if we don't have large scale economic growth. Now it needs to be broad based, it needs to be inclusive and all those adjectives we put around it. But economic growth has to happen or else the, the youth bulge will not become part of uh, the economy and, and society. Again, an unemployed person is not a, the sort of good citizen you'd like to have living next door to you for a long haul. So, but we don't talk enough about economic growth in the development community. Businesses get it. Now, do business, and, and, and we, someone said this morning, you know, it's businesses who create jobs. One of my favorite quotes of a very big company that is a Fortune 100 company has put millions of dollars into job training for young people. But the executive told me once, I, actually we were in a mixed stakeholder group like this, and someone was saying, well, you know, companies have got to create more jobs. And he said, I've been with my company 37 years. I've never once been in a meeting where we've talked about how can we employ more people. But we do employ lots of new people, as we've done over the last 25 years, when our products are great, our services and our sales are great, we're sourcing and producing in the right places. We have the credibility of the companies and the countries and the, the countries and communities in which we're working. When that all works, guess what? We sell more of our stuff and we employ more people. It's a great point. There was uh, the, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, came out with a study um, right at the end of 2014. Um, and they were looking across um, the Eurozone, which is, some of you may know, has had some of the, the highest uh, youth unemployment across the region, average 25%. We, many of us have heard the horror spiking numbers out of Greece, um, Spain, Portugal, Southern, Southern Europe. Um, and they sort of looked at this crisis and Bill, to your point about the importance of sort of economic growth in general, um, their sort of calculations, if you will, found that roughly half of the sort of current um, youth unemployment can be attributed to the economic decline in general. So the downturn since uh, the global recession. So to your point that, you know, it's, it is about the sort of supply and demand, it is about the kind of overall pie, if you will, kind of getting bigger. Um, with that, I'm gonna go to the podium. We're gonna take uh, some of your questions. So I'll see you over there in a moment. See everybody across the room. Um, we'll take three uh, in the first round, and then we'll take another three more. Uh, we'll go with uh, Tim. Hi there, uh, Tim Nurse from Making Sense International. A question for Bill uh, Bill Guyton. Um, in, to return to the question of kind of shared value in agricultural development in youth, it's um, there's not just a shared value question. There's a shared problem in terms of what the next generation is going to look for. Uh, look to and, and how they're going to produce products that you can buy or, and, um, and process. And in our work in agriculture, we're often looking at um, increasing the supply of um, young people who are interested in agriculture, you know, helping them become agri agripreneurs. 
And in one project in Kenya, we, um, there was a, a shared understanding among the private sector as well as the, uh, the farmers that the next generation was a critical aspect. And so um, buyers of horticultural projects started to put pressure on some of the producer associations to say, are you including young people in your structure? Because that's one of the barriers often for young people are the existing, existing structures, whether it's land or access to resources. Um, and so I'm curious in terms of your work or other places, where have you seen um, where the private sector can not only look at making sure the resources are available, but potentially even sourcing or putting criteria for sourcing from associations that include young people or from young people themselves? Great. We're going to take two more in this uh, first round. The woman in front of me, Michael, come. Hello. My name is Joyce Holliday from the International Association of African NGOs. Um, Nicole, you talked about uh, the stigma with agriculture. The stigma stems through every vocational training institution. You know, there needs to be a change of mindset. I said that earlier in my uh, thing. And an average African parent wants their children to become doctors, lawyers, engineers, pharmacists. And nobody wants their kids to become a mechanic, uh, trained to become a plumber, trained to become a farmer, trained to become... In fact, they're not going to pay your school fees. You know, I come out of a, a family of eight. I'm the last of eight kids. All of my siblings are doctors trained in Harvard, in uh, Cambridge. And I have a business degree, but I'm looked upon like, oh, she's the, the challenged one in the family because I'm not a lawyer or a, an architect. So that mindset needs to be changed. And I, I believe that vocational training institution is a key to uh, youth em employment. Uh, you know, I was home this December. The kids that fixed my phone, they're two teenagers, set up a shack in the street corner, and they were able to fix this phone without any training. And I'm thinking to myself, if this, these kids have a short-term training certification uh, uh, institution, I mean, God knows where they'll be. So the, the key thing is, you know, having more vocational training institutions on the continent to grow youth employment. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one more, hopefully uh, a question would be great. There's a gentleman up in front, uh, and then we will do hopefully time for a second round. Hi, uh, Reed Mackey, Child Labor Coalition. Uh, Bill, I was interested in your comments about the professionalization of the pesticide applicators. Is, uh, my question is, is there a minimum age for that? I hope. And uh, secondly, um, you guys have been engaged in efforts to reduce hazardous child labor in cocoa for many years. And I was just wondering, are you seeing signs of success and, and what seems to be working there? Sure, thank you. I guess uh, to answer the first question on, on the Kenya example sounded very interesting. I'd like to learn more about that. And, uh, you know, we're looking in, in West Africa at how we can develop uh, youth groups or you know, future farmers of Africa type programs, looking at maybe even some of the successful models in the United States or elsewhere, or, or preferably even developing countries. So uh, I know that that's a priority right now for both the governments of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Um, in Ghana, the, the Cocoa Marketing Board is, is starting a new program. I think it's called Youth or Young, young Cocoa Farmers. Um, and they, they provide awards to young people and look at how they can help young people get access to land to, to start the farms and to use those as models for, for other youth that might be interested in getting involved. So I'd like to learn more, more about, about your experience and see if, if there might be something we could translate over into uh, to what we're doing. Bill, Sherry, did you just have thoughts particularly on maybe the stigma question um, and any uh, comment? Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's a huge stigma around vocational training. I was in, a, uh, I think it was a high school, um, and uh, we went in and spoke and said, how many of you guys want to be engineers? Everyone raised their hand. How many of you guys want to be doctors? How many of you guys want to be welders, mechanics? No one raises their hands. And then we said, okay, do you understand how much you can make being a welder? No, and then when we said how much you could make being a welder or one of those vocational trades, we then said how many people want to be a mechanic? The whole classroom like raised their hand, so I think it's really an awareness issue. Um, and it's not just an awareness of the student, I think it's a kind of whole of family approach because there's a lot of other people making the decisions other than the student or the job seeker. Um, so I think it's really critical that that perception shift is not just focused on the job seeker because more often than not, they're not the decision maker. And I think really being able to build that awareness in a more holistic manner and determining who is the decision maker 
um, is really critical. I also think there's been a lot of successful programming of bringing kind of the families into these vocations and letting them see firsthand the growth potential, the earning potential um, is really, really critical. And I think that's where we're going to see a more successful move in perceptions and mindsets. You know, with I do have a, my younger daughter is in, in med school. So you might ask, who wants a $200,000 debt when you get out of school before you start that prestigious uh, profession? Uh, we've got, living a few miles north of here, Tom Friedman, whom everyone knows, he says you can't outsource your plumbing to India. So, you know, a plumber can make a lot of money in, in a community like this, particularly when your pipes freeze over the winter and, or your drain clogs up on Thanksgiving day and, and there won't be anyone around until the next Monday. What, what, what do they charge an hour for that? So, you know, some of it does really come down to real work and real money. But I think the TVET issue or the te technical tr training, it, we like to, t the question was earlier, how do you create some of these partnerships with big companies? And co-creation, co-design, co-management too is, is part of it. But we've always looked at, at youth employment as a dual customer. You've got the supply, which are the young people who need and want jobs, whether they know which place they ought to be heading or not. Uh, and maybe they could go to all those different places. All our kids need to go into some of those professions. But it's also the demand side. What do the companies need? And a TVET system to, to do well, and many do do quite well. And TVET uh, in the United States is really mostly our community colleges. Some of them do spectacularly well. I grew up in California, right next to the Stanford campus, and so you had Stanford and Berkeley always vying in football or anything else about who was the smartest. But it's the junior colleges in California that probably had as much to do with, with California's economic boom in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s as these great universities because they were training people for real jobs in their communities. When community colleges or TVET programs get that right because they have a dialogue and a relationship with their local private sector, things work well. But a lot of them don't, and not all of our junior colleges do, so I wouldn't expect a lot of the TVETs in many of these programs. You've mentioned Egypt a lot. Yeah. There, are more, uh, there are more unemployed young Egyptians with college degrees than there are unemployed Egyptians with high school degrees. So it's not just a level of, of education. So how do people come out, and are they ready to look for a job if they're well-educated? Or do they have that mindset, too, to go out and try to find the job? And where would I sell myself, or where would I interview, or how would I interview? And look beyond maybe the public sector for where they would, would want that job. Great, we're going to take one more round. Sherry, your, your comment around a sort of whole of family approach made me think of a, a comment I often make, whether it's about stigma or anything else, is that you know, I often say youth programs don't necessarily have any youth in them. You know, it might often be about um, educating the family, um, a policy shift, or something else that, you know, doesn't necessarily have youth. And I think we need to get our minds around that um, a little bit more. So we have, uh, we're going to take one more round of questions. Hi, excellent panel. Thank you so much. Patricia Langan with Save the Children. This is a question about urbanization and the inevitable migration that we'll all foresee. Um, so I'm wondering if any of the panel have an opinion on how we can better prepare youth who will inevitably migrate to the cities for jobs and self-employment. Thanks. Okay, a couple more. I'd love a question from one of our younger audience members, if, I, if any of you are brave enough. Right here in front of you, this young-ish, younger woman. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Wei Yi. Um, my question is about the transition of uh, economy of the um, Sub-Saharan African economy to uh, uh, knowledge economy. Even though this is not happening yet, but this is the uh, direction. Um, so, um, so how to address the uh, gap between the demand and supply side for the current industry, say uh, the dominating agriculture and mining sectors, and, um, but, but to a future economy, say um, a more uh, servi services um, industry dominated. So this is my question, thank Great you. Question. One more, we'll go uh, this woman here in the front.
Hi, my name is Kirsten. I'm from Global Communities. And my question is directed with Sheree. Is that how you prefer to say it? You mentioned uh, a lot of your work in Jordan and Egypt. And we have, um, my organization currently has a youth workforce development program over there. And you mentioned, as we also have found, that soft skills are you know, or something that is, are lacking in, in future employers coming up. How in the field have you seen technology used to uh, kind of address the lack of soft skills or the even appreciation for soft skills? Because as someone who's not too far removed from the quote unquote youth age that you all would refer to, uh, soft skills are not something in particular speaking, that are emphasized in career preparation. We almost never talk about it. You're just taught to get whatever skills you need and then you get say you have the skills and you get the job but how have you seen or how do you propose or you think uh, you, we could use technology to kind of help develop an appreciation for soft skills because overall we've seen in our youth workforce development programs that they take the classes but I don't I'm not really so sure it resonates with them all the time so um, yes that's it okay Sherry you want to start and then we'll work our way back on those three questions yeah sure so um, I'm going to go back to gaming again because I really think it's this, this effective way of role playing. And um, there have actually been a few games that simulate that interview process. So you have the interviewee sit behind and be the interviewer. And the person shows up late, not dressed properly, not even answering half the questions. It's really putting them in someone else's shoes, which you can do with new technology and innovative technology, and building uh, uh, an awareness and an understanding of the criticalness to have basic business ethics, basic business behavior, to dress a certain way, to show up on time. So there's definitely a, a place for that in terms of um, uh, using technology to, to, to simulate and to role play. I think that that's probably one of the more effective ways to get that embedded into kind of youth's mind. It is very hard to sit in a classroom and and say you need to show up and work on work at time on work at time. Um, another another thing that uh, a lot of people and a lot of you know research has said is that you need to embed it in the technical skills as well because when it's standalone, it just doesn't make sense and it doesn't really resonate to the specifics of their specific job. So I think really embedding soft skills is also something that's that's been successfully implemented. If I could add to that. Uh You've talked about blending and weaving in. Uh, some of that would be called apprenticeships or, or, or internships, where you're actually learning by doing. You're practicing what you learned. Uh, and we certainly have found in vocational training programs that if you don't weave it in, they don't get the soft skills. But you wouldn't say, we're going to now have a day of soft skills, and yesterday we're going to do tech skills. It's how you blend it, blend it in. Uh, there are two types of training that I think Go back now 60, 70 years. When I was in college, we had language labs. You put a headset on. Yes, you had double reel, but you were doing a simulation. That today is done on your, your handheld device. Pilots have been doing simulated training for 50, 60, 70 years. So some of this stuff isn't necessarily, the technology may be new, but the notion of helping people learn by doing in a real, real life, real time situation is not necessarily new. The soft skills, I think, have to be well-defined. We have to be able to get our hands around them. It's easier to, to test a, a sixth grader or a ninth grader in math than it is to test them in this life skill or that life skill. But if we get our hands around that sort of stuff, there are ways of, of analyzing it and then of dosing it, too. Because why give someone or a group of people a bunch of life skills that they already do pretty well? So if we can figure, that, figure out how to test for some of that or analyze it and then dose it, you're giving them the right skills they need. You're also doing it in a cost-effective way because you're not giving a whole bunch of other stuff that they don't need. Uh, great points. I mean, I think it's really important for as much as there is so much opportunity with technology and internet in particular, in rural communities, there's still major digital divide, right, and a lack of access, in particular to the internet. Mobile, a lot more uh, penetration and availability, but sort of going old school, whether it's in person or even, you know, radio and kind of old, old media and old technology, I say, um, and how we can apply those. Um, Bill, thoughts on a couple of the other questions? Yeah, there, there was one question at the, at, in the last round that I really didn't get a chance to answer, so I'll, I'll try to do that the best I can now on, on the Crop Life program that we're doing with the African Cocoa Initiative. And really, it's, it's around both farm safety as well as looking at economic opportunities for 
people in rural sectors. And um, this spray service provider um, initiative is looking at 18 plus year olds who would, who would go in and, and, or who are actually going in to help provide uh, spray service services to, to farmers, but in addition to that, now they're also getting involved in other services such as pruning, uh, such as grafting, and maybe even tree nurseries we're hoping down the, in the future. So it's providing a whole other area of, of employment opportunities for, for people in the rural areas, which is, which is kind of exciting. I think one of the areas that we need to invest more in, though, in, in cocoa is looking at new technologies on labor saving. To, labor saving. Uh, the cocoa tends to be laborious. It's it's uh, you know family family operated operations for the most part. But um, you know I, I keep thinking down the road we, we we need to figure out how to how to solve that to make uh, labor saving technologies more readily available to uh, to small scale farmers. Great. Well, uh, yep. Sherry, last thought. Yeah. Yeah, someone asked about urbanization and kind of how do you oh, yes. work with rural youth kind of the labor migrate or the youth migration. Um, I think that it's really ambitious and a lot of programs aim probably too high in, in getting marginalized, at-risk youth, youth dropouts, rural youth straight into the workforce. And I think that civic engagement is a really critical middle step um, and it can really offer an opportunity to build those life skills, those kind of workforce transition skills in a less... Um, uh, intimidating manner, and I think that that's a very, uh, it's a nice next step kind of to move people from a rural into an urban setting to get at-risk youth kind of slowly into the workforce. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't think those programs are really um, targeting enough, uh, as, are targeted enough as a middle step in that urbanization migration. Great, I'm gonna use that last uh, comment and question as a, as a chance to call up my uh, friend and colleague and our host today, Dan Rundy, who if you haven't seen his terrific um, latest uh, column on urbanization uh, generally um, in Forbes, I believe, um, you should check it out. Um, and I'll use this last chance as a, also a plug. Um, we looked at a lot of the issues we talked about today and others in uh, this report that came out last month um, from CSIS, Key Considerations in Youth Workforce Development. I believe copies um, are still available on your way out downstairs. With that, um, quickly join me in thanking uh, Bill, Bill, and Sherry, who made my job extremely easy. And I'm going to turn the floor back to Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we looked at some big global challenges in the rural sector today. All right, I think one of the big takeaways is companies have a very big role to play in solving these challenges, but at the same time, uh, the lens we want to engage companies on is through their creating shared value lens, not their corporate social responsibility lens. Uh, at the same time, companies can't do this alone. This requires governments and donors and civil society. And uh, so I think it also requires multi-stakeholder partnerships. It, need, it requires leadership. So I really want to thank uh, Nestle for uh, entrusting us with this. I think this is a very interesting conversation. And uh, I'm grateful for everybody for investing the time and being with us today. And uh, thanks, everybody, especially the panelists. And thank you to Nestle.